Uh, bone metastasis and morda uh, mortality. Can we have the ARS, please? So choose the correct statement concerning osteoporosis and fractures. Fracture risk in men on ADT stabilizes and does not increase after two years. Men on ADT have a greater risk for fractures than postmenopausal women. No difference in mortality between men and women who suffer an osteoporotic hip fracture. And lastly, bone mineral density is unreliable as a marker for fracture risk in men on ADT. So very good, very good. So that's a great, great answer. Next one. When using denosumab in the management of ADT-induced osteoporosis, dental exam is not needed as ONJ does not occur. Hypocalcemia is more common with denosumab than with bisphosphonates. Prolia or Exgiva, either one can be used for ADT-induced osteoporosis, or calcium and vitamin E supplementation should not be used. Wow, very good. This is a great group here. Yep, number two, hypocalcemia is more common with denosumab than with bisphosphonates. Next. 75-year-old gentleman presents with newly diagnosed hormone-naive metastatic prostate cancer to bone. After a dental exam and baseline, baseline uh, bone mineral density, a reasonable approach is to start on Prolia with calcium and vitamin D, to start on Exgiva with calcium and vitamin D, bisphosphonates with calcium and vitamin D, one or three, two or three. Yeah, so really, um, uh, it's really two or three. You can use, according to all the guidelines, you can use Exgiva in this gentleman, or you can use bisphosphonates along with calcium and vitamin D. Okay, so the, uh, we all know that uh, there's a big problem when prostate cancer um, um, spreads to the bone, but we also have a spectrum here. We have to remember that many of these men undergo many years of androgen deprivation therapy and are subjected to the uh, bone mineral density loss and increased fracture risk. So we're gonna break this into two pieces, uh, the, uh, the talk into two parts. The first talk we're gonna talk about basically ADT-induced osteoporosis, and in the second part of the talk we're gonna talk more about morbidity and mortality associated with men who manifest bone-positive metastatic prostate cancer. So the number of patients with fractures one to five years after prostate cancer diagnosis goes up, but it goes up more as we know, in men who are on androgen deprivation therapy. And very significantly, the hospitalization risk is, uh, is also much greater in men on ADT who suffer any type of fracture. Uh, this, to me, is a, one of the more interesting uh, graphics. When you look at the survival after a hip fracture, and you look at men versus women, men do much worse after a hip fracture. For whatever reason, it's much more debilitating, and they're more likely to die from their hip fracture than are women who suffer the same fate. So men um, on ADT we know are at uh, fracture risk. Um, we think as urologists, and this goes back and forth over the years, that we tend to underestimate the, the fracture risk in our, in our patients. Many times they will go out and have a, a wrist fracture or a, uh, you know, an elbow fracture, and they don't mention it to us. But clearly, all the large data sets show that the men on ADT do have this increased fracture risk. And it is associated with the duration of time on ADT, how much bone loss, because it's variable. Some men lose a lot of bone uh, mineral, a lot of other men lose less, and of course, the age. The older you are, just naturally, you're going to have more, more osteoporosis. And again, increases with ADT duration. And uh, again, as time goes on, and today, men are on ADT thanks to our um, MCRPC uh, advances longer and longer and longer. So this is something, as time goes on, is gonna be more and more of a problem. So diagnosing osteoporosis, again, everybody knows it's the bone mineral density. Uh, it's the gold standard to determine bone strength, and it, it is highly correlative with fracture risk, and some people say that it's just like uh, a blood pressure for uh, uh, monitoring and following hypertension. These are the WHO criteria on DEXA scan. Uh, it goes from minus one and above. Uh, once you get down to less than minus 2.5 on the, on the T-score, you are diagnosed as having uh, osteoporosis. So this is the famous WHO FRAX risk assessment. Anybody can get on this, uh, on this website. You can go in there, and this gives you the 10-year probability of, uh, of uh, having a fracture. 
And again, it depends on uh, how much of a purist you are in uh, running your patients through, deciding who needs the uh, support or who doesn't. Uh, you can go ahead and do this risk assessment. So basically, for both osteoporosis, and we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, uh, um, bone metastasis, uh, there's prevention and there's also treatment. So basically, the mainstay, if you do anything at all, the mainstay are common sense things, avoid alcohol, avoid smoking, physical activity, healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, but vitamin D supplementation and um, um, the uh, recommended dose right now is somewhere between 1,000 and 1,250 IU um, using, um, using vitamin D. But again, you have to have calcium along with the vitamin D for it to be beneficial. Calcium supplementation has been an interesting moving target. You know, it used to be take as much calcium as you want, but there's been studies out there that show that men who take too much calcium, um, greater than 1,000 milligrams a day, may be at increased risk of a cardiovascular mortality. And it may be as much as 20%. So this is a little bit of a caution to, uh, to us when we sort of over, over, uh, over dispense calcium. So basically, in my world, I think the best OTC choice is the Caltrate, which is 600 plus D3. It gives you 800 IU of cholecalciferol. And then they recommend getting the rest of that calcium from your, uh, from your diet. Of course, bisphosphonates uh, have been a, a wonderful breakthrough available the last 15 years or so. They inhibit osteoclast activity, reduce bone resorption, uh, and they can increase the bone mineral density. It doesn't seem like very much, but when you take that 5% increase um, you know, to 8% increase in the spine and you put it in the FRAX, it really makes a major impact on that patient's 10-year um, fracture rate. Of course, the dental exam, very important. Uh, before starting, uh, and actually it is recommended by, uh, by most organizations to continue that exam every six months while the person is on the, still on the bisphosphonates. We know that bisphosphonates, oral agents, can cause a lot of side effects. We've got to tell patients to make sure that uh, you, know, you sit up uh, for at least a half hour or uh, uh, an hour after you take the bisphosphonates. There are some older folks who get that stuck in their esophagus and get esophageal burns and perforation. But the class warning for all bisphosphonates uh, is uh, bone joint and muscle pain, osteonecrosis of the jaw, ONJ, which is anybody's ever seen it, is one of the really most horrifying uh, side effects of anything that we do. Uh, and this uh, very rare, uh, and it was mentioned uh, the other day about atypical fractures of the femoral shaft, which uh, no one's able to really to sort out what's going on. The other thing that we have out there is the rank ligand um, inhibitor, uh, denosumab, uh, that also increases bone density by about the same amount over several years, uh, and it reduces the incidence of vertebral body fractures by about 70% and hip fractures by about 40%. A whole variety of osteoporosis agents are out there. Some of them are labeled specifically for men. Uh, some of them are not labeled specifically for men with, uh, with uh, ADT-induced osteoporosis. But again, uh, the, choices, uh, the choices are out there. I think probably the most common one used in the United States is the uh, adendronate, 70 milligrams once a week. We have two forms of denosumab, as everybody's aware of, um, and this is where you have to actually use the brand names when you discuss these, because while they're both denosumab, they're completely different indications and completely different uh, volumes and when it comes to the dose. So Prolia is specifically for men on androgen deprivation therapy um, and to manage osteoporosis both in men and women, and that's a 60 milligram sub-Q every six month. However, once you move over to patients with documented bone metastatic disease, uh, the formulation then goes over to Exgeva, and that is uh, basically 120 milligrams sub-Q, but that is given on a monthly basis. National Osteoporosis Foundation really uh, uh, wants us, and this is a general statement about uh, men's health, uh, look at really the, uh, the risk of a man having uh, significant morbidity and mortality. Think about medical-based therapy. If you have any man in a men's health clinic, regardless of prostate cancer, if he's had a vertebral uh, body or hip fracture, if he has a low uh, T-score, and again, if he has a frax probability of a hip fracture or any other significant fracture, uh, think about putting these patients on some type of medical-based therapy. Again, 
As urology gets more into men's health and as men are living longer and longer, these are some areas that we're going to have to be a little bit more uh, aware of. Um, there are uh, programs that have been out there. There are many out there. Uh, one was just reported about a week ago using different approaches, but it showed the same thing, that basically these different programs that are out there recommend DEXA scans for all men greater than the age of 70. This is regardless of their uh, ADT. If a man is over 50 um, and he is on ADT, it is recommended that he has a DEXA scan and then is repeated every, uh, every five years with changes in the uh, approach based on how bad their osteoporosis is or if it's reversing. But again, the common sense thing, smoking cessation, regular exercise, adequate calcium intake, and adequate vitamin D, all common sense things that should be used along with these agents. In the last couple of minutes, we're just going to talk about the morbidity and mortality um, of the, uh, what happens when men develop bone metastatic uh, prostate cancer. And we talk about SREs or skeletal related events. Uh, and this is just sort of a partial listing. Pathologic fractures, core compression, the need for radiation therapy or surgery to the bone are the standard SRE definitions that you'll see in the literature. However, other definitions may exist out there, but those are the hardcore ones that when we talk about most of the studies that look at bisphosphonates or, or denosumab in reducing fractures, talk about that group of limiting those skeletal related events. So if a man has bony metastatic uh, disease, you can see clearly a major impact uh, on survival uh, with, uh, with uh, very grave outcomes uh, historically with bone metastatic prostate cancer. What's very interesting, if you look at this is a, another very interesting curve, if you look at the survival, the mortality increases as you go from nodal disease to bone only to visceral to finally bone plus visceral, which is some of the most uh, lethal combinations of metastatic sites in prostate cancer. But clearly, uh, the, bone, the bone problem is much worse than the lymph node problem, I think, as most of us are aware uh, clinically. So over 90% of men with metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer uh, will have identifiable uh, bone metastasis. And again, we mentioned the skeletal related events associated with metastatic bone positive prostate cancer or core compression, pathologic fractures, and the need to have either surgery or radiation for one of those, uh, those fractures. Uh, the anti-resorptive and bone targeted therapies that we talked about, denosumab and bisphosphonates, it's not really clear that they do improve survival, or, but it is really clear that the skeletal related events in the majority of studies are positive and that there is a benefit to limiting the SREs that we, uh, that we talked about. So about 50% of men with castration resistant prostate cancer will develop METs uh, within two years of CRPC diagnosis. This world is going to completely change, as uh, uh, Dr. Ryder talked about yesterday. The new uh, PET imaging agents are going to probably change our approach to uh, <clears throat> a lot of these. But the um, big number we have is more than 30% of men with purely castrate-resistant prostate cancer thought to be M0. If you study them close enough, you will find that uh, that group, about a third, actually do have metastatic lesions. And that is dependent upon how quickly you or, or how frequently you image these patients. Uh, and this is uh, Dr. Crawford's uh, famous uh, radar paper. Um, that uh, many of us in the room participated in that gives you the goal of identifying patients with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer early so you can offer them some of the advanced, uh, the advanced therapeutics. So interestingly, uh, a very simple ALK-FOS, most of us don't do it, but actually looking at alkaline phosphatase <clears throat> is something I think those of us that treat advanced prostate cancer need to think a little bit more about because it does have very significant um, prognostic implications in predicting the risk of bone metastatic disease. So patients with a low PSA of less than 20 and, and an elevated ALK-FOS, it can be used to identify the patients who are going to be at risk for developing and progressing on their uh, bone, uh, bone metastasis. If we turn to the NCCN guidelines, they clearly support the minute you have castrate-resistant prostate cancer with uh, identified metastatic lesions in the bone, it is strongly recommended that you, um, or actually they say consider bone resorptive uh, therapies with either bisphosphonates or denosumab in that group of patients. 
Um, if you look at zoledronic acid, you're thinking, well, should I use zoledronic acid? Should I use bisphosphonates? Again, not a lot of data out there, but there's this one uh, paper from uh, Lancet a couple of years ago that showed there was a slight uh, improvement in using denosumab over bisphosphonates in the time to the first skeletal, uh, skeletal related event. Zoledronic acid versus denosumab, if you look at the adverse events, they're pretty much the same. I think most of us remember, I guess it was five or six years ago when denosumab came out, we thought the scary boogeyman, the ONJ with the bisphosphonates was not going to be present with the denosumab, but it does turn out it is present in both of them. So whether you're using denosumab or uh, one of the bisphosphonates, you've got to be vigilant for uh, osteonecros osteonecrosis of the jaw. However, when it comes to hypocalcemia, uh, denosumab is more likely to cause a patient to become hypocalcemic. So when the men are on these medications, obviously you need to do periodic uh, measurements of uh, calcium levels. Uh, um, Dr. Ku gave a very nice talk on radium-223 and focused mostly on its survival advantage when it comes to the treatment of metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. Uh, and again, uh, Phil showed this yesterday, showing the improvement in overall survival. But we're talking about it today in the context of improving more, uh, the morbidity and helping patients. And if you look at the Alsimka study, uh, the first symptomatic SRE was greatly improved through the use of uh, radium-223. So not only does it have benefit in the uh, survival category, but it also helps us with some of our skeletal related events. And in fact, if you look uh, at Oliver Sartor's paper where they took the Alsimka data and they looked at patients on radium-223 and bisphosphonates, no real impact on survival. However, you can see that there was a very uh, high, uh, highly statistically significant improvement in skeletal related events. So if you have a patient who's on um, uh, bisphosphonates and they go on radium-223, you should probably, uh, probably consider continuing those drugs. Uh, the radium-223 label uh, is indicated for the treatment of patients with castrate-resistant prostate cancer who have symptomatic bone metastasis and no known uh, visceral or metastatic disease. So they don't specifically talk about reducing skeletal-related events, but clearly most of these patients who are on radium-223 are on the drug to uh, help improve their uh, overall outcome and survival. You're getting the extra hit, the extra benefit of perhaps limiting some skeletal-related events in these men. The recent abiraterone radium-223 debacle uh, notwithstanding in that regard. Um, if you're not using radium-223, we had a nice paper that came out a couple of years ago that gave you the nuts and bolts of how to start using radium-223 uh, in, uh, in your practice. So the bottom line in patients on ADT, again, consider monitoring DEXA. We realize that the insurance companies are a real pain in the butt when it comes to getting it improved. Uh, but if you're going to be serious about it, uh, you know, you should probably monitor DEXA scans. Uh, we have a hard time in Pennsylvania. Unless somebody has proven osteoporosis on a DEXA scan, they won't approve a DEXA scan, Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So tell me how that works. I don't know. Makes it very difficult for us. Strongly consider some type of antiresorptive therapy in men with uh, uh, MCRPC. Uh, Radium-223 is useful in patients with symptoms and can have a significant uh, protective effect. Uh, and again, you need a, if you're going to use Radium-223, you really need to have uh, significant institutional uh, support and the infrastructure to make sure that you can uh, administer it properly. And Dave, again, I thank you, and it gives me great joy to be here with you. Thank you. <laughs>